Noam Chomsky, thanks so much for joining me. Glad to be with you. One of the things that's always struck me about reading your work and listening to your talks is the ability or the capacity humans have for self-deceit. You quote people like John Stuart Mill and, and Walt Waldo Emerson, people who are some of the leading progressives of the time with moral integrity. Um, and you quote them in Emerson's case, advocating invading Mexico, and in, in Mill's case, uh, imperialism by the British in India. I want to know, like, I mean, it's natural that we look to people to emulate and to look as as people with moral integrity. Do you remember when you first started reading these philosophers and and kind of bring some of their less altruistic sides? Somehow, since childhood, uh, it's hard to read anything seriously and not to realize that the people you're reading, however much you admire them, are human beings uh, with, uh, and we all have failings. And the failings often derive from just general assumptions of the time uh, that people can't extricate themselves from. Uh, we all we all surely know this from our own experiences. And uh, it's hard to learn. It's hard to learn about yourself. So, for example, one, not many examples, but one pretty striking uh, array of experiences from the late 60s was had to do with the resistance against the war in Vietnam. The uh, kids who were resisting uh, were facing, were making very difficult choices. You're an 18-year-old kid, and you decide, okay, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to ruin my life. I'm going to go to jail. I'm going to go into permanent exile. I'll never see my parents again, my friends. But I have to do it because it's right. And if you want to be able to do that, you have to be able to convince yourself that you're morally upright. That's justified. And uh, people tried to do it. But you have to recall that that was the, just the bare beginnings of the feminist movement. And inside the resistance organizations, of course, there were women. But the women were expected to be servants. They brought out the food, you know took the notes, uh, the men did the important things. And the early stirrings of the feminist movement in the, among young people uh, began with uh, the raising of consciousness that uh, this is a form of oppression. We don't have to accept it. Well, at that point, young men who were, in fact, facing extremely uh, dangerous and difficult decisions somehow had to come to the terms with the fact that they had never faced, which they had never faced, that they too were oppressors. And that's hard. And it was true for them, particularly because of the extreme situation they were in, but it was true for everyone. Uh, men just had never thought about the fact that they were oppressors. In fact, women had never much thought about the fact that they were oppressed. And when these things break into consciousness, you get a new perspective on yourself, and it can also often be pretty distressing. And that's true all through life. Uh, if you, the people you mention, um, you know, if, if, if they were alive today and you could bring their words to them, they'd be shocked. Yeah. How did, did you have any experiences yourself having to confront some? I mean, you, you do say how hard it is to look our, at ourselves honestly in the mirror. Were there any experiences you yourself faced in, in confronting your actions and, and I guess, your, your thoughts? Well, that was one. Everyone went through that. I was involved with the resistance. Of course, I was old. I was technically a draft resistor, but too old to be drafted. But I was very much involved with all of this. We all had to face it. We faced it in the uh, resistance support groups. Uh, we were taking chances. We were, I mean... I came pretty close to a long jail sentence. It was possible for all of us. So there were chances. Uh, but um, we realized at this point that the resistance support group were almost entirely men. And the uh, lead positions were almost entirely men. 
It didn't have to be, but they were. And uh, we all had to come to terms with this. But there are many other cases. I mean, I recall. <clears throat> I'll tell you another experience, which stuck in my mind. <clears throat> Back in the early 60s, I went to a civil rights demonstration down in the south, Jackson, Mississippi. It was pretty brutal. Uh, state police beating people bloody, driving up to the states of the federal building, you know. A very moving experiences in the evening in black churches where people were trying to regain their courage and companionship. Altogether an extremely moving experience. Uh, a couple of weeks later, I happened, uh, I was teaching a summer, sc summer school in Indiana, it was, and I was walking across, you know, nice campus, summer, everybody cheerful. But I was walking across campus and um, ran into a kid who I'd met down in the demonstration. And we talked a little, and we just walked across the campus together and uh, quietly. And all of a sudden he turned to me and he said, looking, he said, talking to the others, pointing to other students around, he said, how can they be so interested in phonemes? Meaning, how can they be working so hard on narrow technical questions when this is going on right before their eyes? And that's a, and it's true, how can you be? But we do it all the time. And we have to face it all the time, if we're honest, uh, right this minute. Uh, and it's a hard, it's a hard realization. And it keeps coming back. So did that have an effect on you? Like, was this before you had dedicated yourself consciously to becoming an activist? Well, first of all, I never, I mean, that goes back to childhood. I was an activist long before I got to college, you know. Uh, there was, um, in very, in, you know, there's different things in the 1930s and 1940s. Uh, during the 50s, I kind of dropped out for a while. I was at college, I was married, had kids, family, you know, got a job, which I never expected to get. And it was a pretty passive period, nothing much was going on. Things should have been going on. There were a lot of awful things happening, but nobody much was paying attention to them. I mean, even South Vietnam. I mean, the time to get involved in active protest against the war in Vietnam would have been maybe in early 50s. Uh, not early 60s. That was much too late. By then, you know, maybe 80,000 people had been killed, all kind of atrocities and so on. Uh, so, but in the early 60s, I came back into it again, mostly with the anti-war movement, partly civil rights, later other things. So it was it was revival, not not beginning. And when I got back into it, I. I did think about it. I mean, I, I knew enough from experience to know this is not the kind of thing you can put one foot in and then walk away. If you get involved, it's going to get deeper and more compelling. It'll draw you away. And a lot of things in my life then, which I was liked, liked my work. I, I liked teaching here. I had a family, little kids. Everything looked nice. You know, but I said, well, you know, got to you have to make a choice because once you get into this, it's it's all, it's going to drag you farther and farther, which is true. It does one of the things that uh, personally uh, is an example of that is you know I can watch talks or watch documentaries and think about things like global warming and, and all these big issues confronting our times, um, and then sort of bracket it to one side of my mind and then. That's right continue moving on because it, it's uh, I think that's what stops a lot of us from getting involved because the implications w would be that we would have to drop everything if these things really were as, as dire as, as partly but of course you know even the most dedicated people have to do that I'll tell you another anecdote which remind me uh, this is from India I, mean, I was in India I don't know if you've been there but uh, I mean it's just a, a dramatic experience there's a lot of wealth, a lot of vitality, a lot of excitement, and miserable poverty, which you just can't miss. It's all around you. Uh, one time, a couple of years ago, I happened to be there, and uh, I was driving in New Delhi to a demonstration where I was going to give a talk, and uh, 
Another person was in the car with me, a woman who was also going to give a talk there. Uh, she's a woman who had uh, uh, had taught in the university. She was not a university position, but she left uh, in order to go live in a poor village in one of the poorest areas, Rajasthan, where she lived in a hut and you know, what we would call indescribable conditions, working mainly on women's issues. And I think she'd been there about 17 years by then. So a really dedicated person, threw her life into it. I noticed as we were driving through this, when you drive through a, a, a city, as soon as the car stops, uh, there's a horde of miserable people who come uh, asking for a, you know, a rupee, a, a penny, you know, uh, showing a, a, a gypsy woman with a starving child, you know, every horror you can think of. And uh, she told me right away, don't give anyone anything. Uh, because once you do, you can't make any dent anyway, and once you do it, just uh, you get a mob. But as we drove, I noticed that she wasn't looking out the window. And I asked her, you know, I, I asked her, well, you know, how do you live with all this? And she said, the only way you live is not looking. Uh, you, you can't look and survive. So you have to somehow wall yourself off just in order to keep going. And this is a person who had dedicated her life at a level that you almost never see. But she's right. Uh, we all have to do it. Uh, you can't survive otherwise. But it's easy to, the bracketing, so it's necessary in some sense, but it's very easy to overdo it. Like take global warming, which you mentioned. I mean, that's a really dire catastrophe. Uh, Canada right now is on the verge of destroying civilization. It's almost literally true. If Canada proceeds with tar sand development in Alberta, uh, the effects could be really dire. If Obama approves the XL pipeline, which will then accelerate the tar sands development, and uh, that continues, uh, the effects on human life could be really severe. How much is being done about it? Well, you can tell me. And it's this is not small. It's not like uh, uh, stopping a war across the ocean is very important, but destroying human civilization is more important. And it's and the cho cho choices are right before us. And uh, you know very well how people are dealing with it. All of us. And for Canada, it's particularly important. Uh, one thing you point out is that uh, after talks dealing with activists in, in developed nations like Canada and the U.S., you often get the question, well, what can I do? Whereas when you go to, to developing nations like Colombia or you talk to the Kurds in, in Turkey, they don't ask you what to do. They tell you what they're, they're doing. I just came back from Turkey and it's the same thing. I, was there, I happened to be there this time. Uh, partly for protests about repression of Kurds, but uh, the, main, the main invitation was for a, a talk at a memorial for a, an assassinated journalist, Hrant Dink, had been assassinated a couple of years ago too, because he was exposing Armenian uh, atrocities a century ago, uh, which really broke with his... Uh, it was probably the government was behind his assassination. It's kind of obscure, but that's what it looks like. Anyway, it was a bad call because the assassination aroused enormous concern and involvement. And so, for example, at this memorial, uh, uh, there was also a de huge demonstration uh, of people going through uh, uh, Istanbul, uh, um, big demonstration at the site of the assassination. Uh, uh, people really engaged. There's been a lot of it, further exposure of what happened, the efforts to try to overcome some of the you know, re re rehabilitating, rebuilding, destroyed churches and things. And, about, and I was talking mainly to activists, people who were there. But, but, and these are, and you know, being an activist in Turkey is a lot harder than in Canada or U.S. It's a pretty repressive state, and there's a lot of um, state violence. There's, uh, it has, for example, more journalists in jail than any other country in the world. It's the world champion, and it's increasing. But they're very, 
Uh, they're very courageous. They're um, uh, energetic. They uh, they want to talk to you about what they're doing and how you can help. And that's normal. Uh, for us, it's easy. Um, we're very privileged. You know? I mean, there's some repression, but by comparative standards, we live in very free societies, and there isn't a lot that the government can do to you, especially uh, people like us, you know, who who are part of the privileged sector. We go to college, you know, that sort of thing. And uh, there's just endless opportunities. I mean, I, I just mentioned one tar sands, but can go on listing any number of others. Can you take me back to your own evolution when you were becoming more active and decided to that you would have to jump in fully to activism and politics? I guess how conscious was the decision and what stopped you from doing it earlier? I mean, were you worried about being a rabble rouser when you're a, a professor and giving up the comforts that came along with your life as a linguistics professor? I was, it was very conscious. I hadn't thought about it seriously. I mean, I wasn't giving up my life. I continued to teach, you know. I wasn't giving up my family, spent time with the kids, but uh, it's, you know, it's facing risks. And soon, within about seven or eight years, I was actually facing a long jail sentence, which you know, I didn't anticipate specifically, but... Uh, for what? For uh, organizing resistance. Uh, which was, you know, technically illegal. I can't say it was repression. Was this the not paying taxes? Uh... Well, not paying taxes. I started earlier, uh, in the year around 1965, I guess, and that could have led, and sometimes does lead to, uh, uh, a government reaction. Most of the time, they just, just take the money, basically. Uh, but the support for um, uh, draft resistance was more serious. You know, that meant. Uh, uh, openly defying the openly defying laws regarded as crucial, and uh, well, I wasn't by any means the only one to do it. But uh, I was. Uh, I remember? The, I don't know if you recall the Spock trial. No. Well, one of the big trials was uh, I was an unindicted co-conspirator and was named as the person who would be indicted in the next trial. Uh, mostly the trials were kind of a joke. They didn't know what they were doing. Uh, but it was serious enough so that uh, we had three kids by then. My my wife went back to school after about a 16-year gap because we figured she'd probably have to take care of the kids. You know? And uh, But it's, you know, it's not like facing repression in a country like Turkey. We shouldn't exaggerate. It's uh, like you go to jail, you're not going to be tortured, for example. And uh, 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 at first, there, uh, the early stages, there was really not much to do. Uh, support for the war was just overwhelming. I mean, the first talks I gave were literally in people's living rooms or in a church with four people or something. In fact, the first efforts to have demonstrations, public demonstrations here in Boston, which is a pretty liberal city, uh, were just smashed by counter-demonstrators. There is a place in Boston for demonstrations, the Boston Common, traditional place for public speaking. It was kind of like Hyde Park in London, that sort of thing. And our first public demonstration there we planned for, actually it was October 65, it's about four years after the war started. South Vietnam was already half destroyed. But uh, it, it was broken up violently with a, a strong support of the liberal press, uh, supporting the smashing up of the demonstration. Uh, uh, a couple of years later, and it continued like that, but uh, a couple of years later, it developed into a mass movement by 60 late 67, 68, it was a substantial popular movement. What was the reaction of your fellow uh, colleagues at MIT and professors? I mean, you're right that there isn't many risks that go along with becoming involved with politics and activism here in, in America and, and Canada, but it seems that, as you point out, the higher, more prestige and more recognition you've gotten from the system the because you have something to lose and just a sense of respect from your colleagues um, it seems almost harder to to give that up and, I, there yeah. was plenty of support um, I mean not you know small minority of the faculty were also seriously involved 
In fact, uh, oddly enough, the, the lab where I was, where the department was, electronics lab, uh, was 100% supported by the three armed services. That was the main academic centers of anti-war resistance. Uh, practically, you know, the, practically the whole faculty was even either involved or sympathetic, student body too, and uh, um, others around the college. So it wasn't, you know, not everyone participated directly, but there was a fair amount of sympathy. A lot of antagonism, but okay, live with that. So you, you didn't suddenly lose respect of your colleagues or anything like that? Many, yeah. Uh, many because they just don't see why you're wasting time like this. It, it's different in different countries. I remember kind of one country that's kind of interesting is Japan. I had gone there fairly regularly since the early 60s. And there the... Uh, um, there was uh, there was an activist, a uh, fairly militant group, but it just wasn't the kind of thing to do, like at the universities you didn't do things like that. I remember uh, uh, was, uh, Japan was one of the few countries I went to until recently uh, where I wasn't asked to give political talks. I was asked to give uh, technical talks on the, you know, radio, uh, newspapers, uh, general audiences, and so on, which was okay. And uh, 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 I was occasionally asked to give a talk, but it was usually by um, expatriates from Australia or somewhere. And I remember one talk I gave to, uh, this must have been the mid-'80s, probably about Central America or something like that, was a couple of Japanese professors came. And uh, they came mainly because they were curious as to why I was spending time on things like massacres and torture and terror when I could have been writing a technical paper on some problems that came up in footnote four of the latest. Uh, that's uh, the, the inverse of this young guy I mentioned to you uh, at the summer school in the early 60s. Uh, and that's, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty standard attitude. Yeah, quite apart from not liking what you're doing, because people tend more or less reflexively to support the crimes of their own state. That's why they're mostly unknown. So, for example, uh, they're literally unknown. I mean, there's very, very rarely a poll asking people uh, to assess, say, the number of people killed in Iraq or Vietnam or something. But when the polls are taken, the results are utterly shocking. Uh, a, a tiny fraction of the reality because people just have no sense of it. It's just too easy to protect yourself from. You don't want to know things like that. You might know about a particular atrocity that makes the news, you know, be lie, Abu Ghraib, but not, not that these things are just footnotes to much worse atrocities. What, what sort of advice would you give to someone just trying to grapple with how the world really works and how power works when faced with the fact that, you know, the New York Times doesn't necessarily talk about the crimes of, of the West, whereas all the crimes of who knows who, um, Cuba or, or things like that, get a lot of play. How do you start digging? I don't know if you can see a painting that's half hidden back there, but if you look at the painting afterwards, you'll see it's a, it's a painting of... Uh, that shows, it depicts Archbishop Romero, who was assassinated while reading Mass, uh, the angel of death hovering over him, uh, six uh, murdered uh, Jesuit priests, Latin, te leading Latin American intellectuals, their housewife and their daughter. Very graphic, I'll show it to you later. Uh, if, if anything like, uh, this was 1989, it was the end, it sort of almost brought to, the, to an end a bitter, violent U.S. war against the church in Latin America. And that's not an exaggeration. It started with Vatican II. Uh, Pope uh, Ratzinger, who just retired today, uh, re yesterday he announced his resign. He was uh, uh, fighting the war from the Vatican side. He was the enforcer for the Vatican. But the U.S. Army was doing it on the American side, and they're proud of it. 
So if you read the uh, uh, talking points for the School of the Americas, which trains Latin American officers, uh, they announce that they're with pride that the U.S. Army helped defeat liberation theology. Liberation theology was a movement which really took off in 1962 when, on the 23rd, Vatican II, uh, tried to transform the church back to what it had been before it was taken over by the Roman Empire in the 4th century, the Church of the Persecuted, not the Persecutors. And uh, that had a big effect in Latin America. Uh, priests, uh, bishops, lay people went out to bring the message of the Gospels to poor people, uh, preferential option for the poor. Uh, the Gospels is kind of a radical pacifist uh, document. People read the words, but they don't think about it. Uh, and that set off uh, uh, the Vatican repression and the much more violent U.S. repression, leading, culminating pretty much in that, almost unknown. Um, if, if anything remotely like that had been going on, say, in Eastern Europe, not only would everyone know about it, we could have had a nuclear war. But when it's going on under our eyes and we're doing it, you don't see it. I presume it's barely known in Canada. But uh, on the anniversaries of, say, the assassination of the archbishop or uh, uh, the Jesuit intellectuals, uh, uh, there'll be a commemoration in Boston, but usually in a church in a poor neighborhood, not not in Harvard Square. You know. So, how how do we decide? Just, I mean, I mean, when there's so little information out there about the crimes that we do, of information. We can get the information. But it's alternative, I guess. You have to work. I mean, it's not going to be in the headlines. Like uh, the headlines about the Pope today and the articles, I mean, they may be a word about how he was opposed to liberation theology, but you're not going to find anything about what I just described. But the information's there. I mean, people write about it. The original documents are there. Uh, but we can't... We can claim that it's work to get information, but not that we can't get it. But, but until it occurs to you that there is a difference? It has to, has to occur to you. It has to occur to you that there's a problem. Otherwise, uh, you don't look. And most of the time, it's easier just to assume everything's okay. I mean, the same is true on, I mean, even things like the fate of the species. Well, let's go back to the tar sands again. Sure. You know, really major issues are at stake, like the fate of the human species. But it's much easier to pretend I don't know anything about it. Yeah. I find myself avoiding the articles yeah. in the paper. Yeah, it's painful to know, and if you know, it's a little bit like this Indian woman looking out the window. If you look out the window, you've got to do something about it, and that's hard. I know you don't uh, dwell on spiritual or psychological explanations of, of how power works and, and why we do what we do. But it, it seems that the root of what you're talking about in, in many ways is first a need to let go of our attachment to both our ego and I guess our attachment to our uh, pride of state or pride of group. Could you, could you talk about that? I, I don't think there's anything profound to say. I think it's pretty clear what it is. I mean, we all have, some of us really suffer, but not you and me and the people we know. We have fairly decent lives. You know, we do a lot of things we like to do and uh, a lot of rewards in it and so on. Work we like, you know, people we like and so on. And it's, um, it's just uh, easier not to face uh, the kinds of realities which would lead us to giving it up even in part. So it, you draw, you, you close the window. Uh, we do it all the time. And as I say, at some level, you couldn't survive if you didn't do it. Like the woman in the car in New Delhi. She does it. I respect that. She has to. Otherwise, there'd be no way for her to survive. But for most of us, we close the window much too early. And we're like these people that young man in Indiana was referring to rather work on a technical problem. One thing that you always talk about or point out when people ask certain questions about um, 
ask your advice on how to do this or how to best achieve change is that there's no magical answer. There's no easy solution. People want the quick fix, but what it really takes is years of boring work and dedication to organizing and protest and, and education and things like that, things that are, aren't uh, necessarily sexy or, or exciting. Um, they're not, really not ex well, I, you know, they can be exciting, but the point is they're not going to give instant gratification. Uh, there'll be, you can make efforts, sometimes they'll succeed, partially uh, there'll be a reaction, you'll lose, and you go on. I mean, take what's happening right now in, uh, say, uh, Egypt and Tunisia. Uh, those two uprisings were extremely important historical events. I mean, there have been major achievements. On the other hand, there have been huge failures. And they're now at a stage where it might all collapse. The chaos in the streets in both Cairo and Tunis. Nobody knows where it's going. Nobody can even think of a simple solution. It seems essential that we deal with sort of the uncertainty that we don't know if our efforts are going to be successful or not, and we don't know what's going to actually work. The only thing we know with complete, a lot of confidence is if we don't do anything, things will get worse. And is that what keeps you going, I guess, just knowing that things can change, but you don't know when or how? Yeah, you never know when or how. I mean, take, say, the Occupy movement. I mean, if I'd been asked uh, one week a day before the Zuccotti Park encampment, I'd have said it's a waste of time because it couldn't possibly work. I was totally wrong. It sparked a mass popular movement. Well, you could say the same about Tahrir Square. They go back to you know, 1960, a couple of kids and students, black students in Greensboro, North Carolina, uh, decided to sit in a lunch counter. Well, of course, they were arrested, brutalized, sent off, could have been the end of it. Uh, but it turned out others came. And pretty soon you had people riding freedom buses. Pretty soon you had mass marches, you had demonstrations. Ultimately, there were achievements. Achievements are limited, so there were achievements. I mean, it was undoubtedly the civil rights struggle had major lasting achievements. On the other hand, if you take a look at the African-American population in the United States, they're about as bad off as they were then. And, and then to just then off, I mean, you're in your 80s and you maintain a schedule that would tire most 30-year-olds. You're constantly answering emails, you're flying across the world, you're giving interviews. Um, so what personally keeps you going just in, in the face of having to deal with and talk about things like the essential end of the species? Because the alternative is totally unacceptable. So you do what you can do. And you avoid going into cynicism just by the cases where things have changed? Pardon? And you avoid cynicism by just seeing how things have in fact changed over the years? I don't know. Cynicism is a kind of an evasion. And we, we should face face the world realistically. There's a lot of unpleasant things. Uh, what? You know, it's not a base for cynicism. It's a base for doing work. Professor Chomsky, thanks so much. Yeah, thanks.